Hello. Um, sorry for the late start here. We we had some technical difficulties. If you're watching this on YouTube later, uh, thanks for toughing it out, Anthony. Um, uh, we there's some internet connection problems. It's always the issue when doing things online like this. Uh, everything depends on a series of tubes, um, <clears throat> as the saying goes. Um, but we're going to get started here. Uh, we got a lot to. I I have a lot of ambition for covering a lot of. Um, intellectual territory here with Rawls today. So I want to get right into it. Before I start though, uh, anyone um, have any feedback about how we handled the code last last time, the code word? Did that work out okay? Did anyone get into difficulties with that? Is all right. No dis. No. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, if something happens, definitely let me know with that. Um, I might try to do it. Yeah. No. No video. So I'm just going to do it audio, audio today because we're having these technical difficulties. So that'll be fine. Um, so I'll just tell you it. So, but it was a good idea. So thank you. I can't remember who suggested that, but uh, thank you for that idea. Um, okay. So getting back into roles here. Um, so I mentioned at the end of class yesterday that. Um, the one of the big ideas that Rawls is going to be working with is that in defining um, principles of social justice, the, the ultimate moral guidelines that are going to inform all the rest of the choices about how we set up the game of this cooperative uh, institutional system that is society, this system of cooperation, how is that going to look? Well, it's going to need to be um, defined by uh, you know, a vision for what is actually right, like what's ideal here. And to do that, Rawls is really nervous about uh, bias, basically. He's really worried about how we construct um, visions of social justice that benefit ourselves, basically. Um, so to, this, is a, this is a little ham-fisted way to present it, but imagine um, uh, that you're someone who has um, not very much power or wealth or positionality in society. You might be drawn toward a position like what we were describing yesterday of, of being a social liberal, having a, a socially liberal conception of um, social justice. Social liberal is a technical term of art here, so don't just read that as like what the words suggest, but it's a technical position like I was describing yesterday that puts well-being above uh, liberty in terms of fundamental moral values. So it'd be more like uh, lots of heavy socialist systems, um, trying to um, put safety nets in place, things like um, Medicare or Social Security or anything like that, or wealth redistribution, things like that are, are going to be part of the program for the social liberal. And if you don't have a whole lot, um, if you're sort of on the bottom of in the bottom classes of society, then you might be more sympathetic with that conception of social justice because it'll be to your personal advantage to do so. And you definitely aren't going to be very attracted to something like libertarianism as the sort of opponent here. Um, because under libertarian systems, like, you're not going to be looked out for. Like, people aren't going to be necessarily um, looking to benefit you. Um, and likewise, if you have lots of money and power and privilege in society, then you might be more attracted to conceptions of uh, libertarianism, uh, that, that kind of notion of social justice, because you'll, it'll, it means society, the game of society, is giving you more freedom to do what you want with what you have, and you have a lot. And you aren't going to be maybe as big of a fan of something like social liberalism or socialism, because it's going to be taking that away from you. Um, so Rawls is kind of thinking, people are naturally self-interested, and this is going to not only dictate their actions, but also it will influence what they find rational. So the, the arguments that are offered in these debates, which, you know, Rawls is mid-20th century, late 20th century. Um, so we've had a lot of discussion about these different conceptions of social justice for a long time now. And Rawls is is thinking, yeah, that, that uh, phenomenon of self-interest infiltrates which arguments we find compelling. 
but in a way that's biased. It's not just looking at the arguments themselves, um, but sort of like what we find intuitive. And uh, our personal situation definitely influences that. Um, can I repeat that? Yeah. So the basic idea here um, is that uh, if you have a lot of power and privilege in society, then you're going to be a fan of maybe something more like libertarianism because it gives you more freedom to do what you want with what you have, um, and you have a lot. So you've got more latitude in society. You get to do, you have more power. And, <clears throat> and Rawls is thinking that w basically rationality, what we find reasonable about these different arguments for different conceptions of social justice is definitely going to be influenced in a biasing sort of way, in an irrational or irrational sort of way, which of the arguments we find compelling or intuitive. Um, so our, our positionality affects how we conceive of rationality. Okay, did that come through? Does that make sense? Still having connection issues, I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what, what this uh, emoji is meant to suggest, Mark. Toughen it out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, this is I am always so sad when this happens for online formats. I don't know if the weather is doing anything with it. Shushan, it looks like you've got something you're saying. For me, your voice came through. Okay, cool. Okay, okay, all right. So with that sort of setup, I mean, Rawls is, Rawls is a believer in critical thinking. You know, he... He wants us to, like a lot of philosophers, I mean, myself included, most most philosophers are like, what else are we going to do other than try to make the best arguments and see where the chips fall down and be critical reasoners about stuff? And Rawls is interesting because he's sort of acknowledging that reason is not something that we engage with perfectly, that we've got these uh, barriers for our ability to entertain arguments sensibly. And when you've got these two like expressions of liberal political philosophy, libertarianism and social liberals, um, developing their views for a long time, the concern can be that you know each one of them internally to itself is capable of presenting a pretty compelling argument to rationalize itself, um, but that this um, rationalization makes it easy for you to just kind of swim in the waters of what makes sense to you, and kind of like the um, the uh, uh, what's it called the like bubbles that uh, the echo chambers that people uh, have to deal with today right how hard it is to maybe really have intellectual charity for your opponent here and Rawls wants to do something about that um, but this this idea of defining justice through a process is not a new idea um, there's a long tradition connected with these uh, different political philosophies that um, comes from a bigger moral theory that's called uh, contractarianism is one of them or contractualism is the other and they're not the same thing those are not synonyms but they both want to say something like uh, what is morally just is the result of a certain type of reasoning and the, this this idea is not completely unfamiliar. We, we've talked about social contract theories before, and we are definitely going to be talking about it again today with Rawls. Rawls is another version of a social contract theory. But it, it has these underlying sort of meta meta-ethical theories about how moral truth gets set in the first place. And it's related to contracts. So, uh, like consensual agreements. But not necessarily actual ones, but theoretically ideal ones. So, uh, contractarianism is more of like how Hobbes is thinking about things, which we've talked about earlier in this class. For a contractarian, justice is just whatever people decide to agree on, the rules that they decide to agree on, based on mutual self-interest. So it's understanding rationality in terms of self-interest. Um, the two theories, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's contractarianism and contractualism. 
Those names are very, very similar, and it's really easy to mix them up. I mix them up, up all the time. But the, the, the key thing I think you can remember is the contractarian kind of sounds like libertarian, and libertarians are more interested in just letting people do what they want with what they have. You know, you're not doing this heavy regulation of their choices. And that's kind of like contractarians in the sense that they're saying what makes sense are, or what are going to be the rules of justice are the ones that come from people mutually agreeing for self-interested reasons that this is a good rule they want to follow. So when we talked about Hobbes before in the state of nature, everyone's like, this sucks. It's in my self-interest to live in a world in which I don't have to look over my shoulder for someone plunging the knife in every second. So I'm going to agree with other people to set up a justice system, a government, to create a peaceful society, that kind of thing. I have to give up some freedom in the process, but I'm, I'm getting bang for my buck here. Um, I give up the opportunity to harm others in order to gain protection against them harming me. And that's a purely self-interested, you know, contract, like a, a negotiation. If you imagine the people in society getting together and being like, what are the rules we should set up? Everyone's like, well, it's in my self-interest to agree to this, and it is for you too, so let's do it. And we sort of invent what are now the rules of justice through that process. Okay, so whatever is just is the result of an agreement, even a hypothetical agreement, but for the contractarian, it's based on mutual self-interest. This idea has come up before. We, we've talked about this in the quarter so far. Um, the contractualist is a little different. Um, the contractualist also is impressed with the idea that justice is something we kind of invent or construct. It's not necessarily like this just reality that's out there, these facts. But it's something that we decide on and create. But if, for the contractualist, the contractualist, it's a little closer to something like Kant and Kant's Kingdom of Ends. What would it be rational for us to agree on that's premising things like um, fundamental equality of moral worth for everyone? So it's not self-interested. Um, it's it's more it's understanding rationality in a different way. When I was talking way back about Hobbes and social contract theories, I said how they're both very much linked to what is rational. Like when they're thinking about state of nature, um, what would it be rational for people to do in a state of nature, contrasting Hobbes and Locke. Locke's on the side of more like mm -hmm. contractualism because um, he's trying to create a, a system in society that reflects these moral realities that are still present in the state of nature, whereas Hobbes was just thinking about self-interest. Um, Hayden asks, so it's essentially my reality versus your reality. Um, I don't think so um, for either one of them because um, people, even if you're self-interested, you could be irrational in how you're pursuing your self-interest. And for Hobbes, the contractarian, um, what we should agree to or what would be the principles of justice, not everyone will agree to, but they ought to. You know, Hobbes still thinks that's true. It's just based on a ideal uh, notion or a, a, a conception of ideal rationality that defines rationality in terms of acting in your self-interest. Whereas for the contractualist, the notion of rationality is something different, not self-interest. So that's why I'm bringing up Kant here, because if you remember, Kant made a big deal about rationality and reason as being the basis for the moral law, um, but it definitely was not a self-interested principle that he was using there. He was talking about the, you know, the categorical imperative that I'm logically required to respect how everyone has intrinsic value, that people are to be valued as ends in themselves and not as means for me to pursue my self-interest, for example. Am I answering your question, uh, Hayden? Is that... Is that uh, kind of getting at what you were thinking about? Yes? Okay, cool, cool. So contractualism is based on only logic. Well, you can run a kind of Kantian version of this, but some of the other modern versions of contractualism don't use um, 
Kant's analysis of logic in reason to, or the categorical imperative to justify this. They just think, you know, the fundamental axiom of justice is, does it require some notion of equality? Um, so there's some other versions out there. Scanlon, this philosopher named Scanlon is a really famous one. But we're not, I don't want to get lost in the weeds on that because Rawls is going to be doing something weird and different here. He's not quite a full contractarian, and he's not quite a full contractualist either, but he's heavily working in this theme of contracts and thinking about um, what is rational or what is uh, some sort of rational process as being the one that's going to determine what the principles of justice are. So instead of just arguing straight for principles of justice, which he's worried about is vulnerable to this sort of biasing stuff, he wants to define theoretically a deliberative process that that's the process is what we're putting, that's the basket we're putting our eggs into, that this is a process that we can be confident will give us the correct principles of justice. Or maybe we should put it this way. It's the legitimacy of the process from which the principles that we arrive at in that process gain their legitimacy. So we're not just jumping to the end of the story, we're watching about how we're getting there. Um, and that's why I framed this all with Rawls being concerned about bias, because bias is a process of decision making, or it influences the process of decision making, of what beliefs we're going to adopt. And Rawls is like, yeah, doing that in a biased way is illegitimate, so how can we do it in an unbiased way? That's what he's really curious about. Okay, How's this going so far? I want to check in with everybody. This is a big idea. Very important for getting inside Rawls's head here. Good? Good? Okay, okay. I want to go back before, I mean, we could, we could kind of keep rolling here, but I, just for the sake of, of um, intelligibility and accessibility here for some pretty theoretical ideas. Um, think about, um, it, well, Rawls makes a big idea about fairness. Fairness is this, you know, a uh, big word for him, a touchstone word throughout his entire work. Um, that, uh, he, in fact, he calls his position justice as fairness. Fairness is what he thinks justice is all about. And that's at the end of the game here. But, but well, actually, no, sorry. That we don't interpret that as fairness as the result of this process of like this is what justice is going to look like but more of a fair process of arriving at the principles of justice so if you're if the conception of justice of social justice that you're a fan of is a result of your contingent situation in society that doesn't necessarily consider other people's position in society so that wouldn't necessarily be fair whether you're on the um, you know, at the top of the pyramid or at the bottom of the pyramid of the social classes, um, either way, Rawls is saying there's a concern here. So, uh, of this, like, biasing influence. So, um, I wanted to uh, unpack this idea of fairness a little bit by giving you another uh, example. So, both contractualists and, and contractarians both don't talk this way. Um, both of them would agree with this as an absurd example. But I'm going to use it anyway as a, as a kind of way to help us think about contracts in a way that's different, that's more theoretical rather than about how things actually happen. So I touched on this a little bit with Nozick. Imagine um, we value consensual agreements. Because we value personal liberty, self-determination, all this kind of thing. We don't want to interfere with people's um, self-determining wills. That's a very Kantian kind of idea. It's very familiar in morality for us to value autonomy and value freedom and liberty. Um, again, everyone in this debate agrees that that's a good thing. How big of a priority is another question. But let's just say that's our starting point. So we want to let people do what they want with what they have. Um, given their position, that they are free to do what they will with it. Um, what you can't do is do actions that involve other people without their consent. So consent, consensual agreements becomes the name of the game. That's what we're all concerned about. But you can imagine how because of people's different positions when they come to the negotiation table, like how much power and leverage they have, their ability to 
um, negotiate for the result of that consensual agreement is going to be different. So let's say it's a uh, we're in a, a economic recession. Everyone needs jobs, and I own a factory. I've got the jobs, and so I'm like, I'm going to offer really low wages, like ridiculously low wages, um, and I can do that because I know that people are going to take the jobs because something is better than nothing, and they're in a position of weakness. If someone's like, uh, I'm not going to work for you for that wage, that's ridiculous. I'm like, cool, bye. I'll, I know there's someone else next in line who's like, yeah, maybe I will take that because that's going to be better than nothing. So the, the people, all of you who are looking to get jobs, because there are so many people who need jobs and there's so little uh, supply for the demand, um, I'm able to really leverage this situation. I've got you over a barrel, right? I'm not going to violate the principle of liberty here. I'm not going to force you to work in my factory for me. Um, like slavery, not chaining you to the factory floor or something. Um, I'm saying take it or leave it. It's your choice. You get to decide if you consent or don't consent. Do you think this situation is fair? <laughs> Sounds like driving for Uber. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, this is probably not just a theoretical thought experiment, but unfortunately, a very ubiquitous part of everyday life in our world today. I, I'm not seeing a lot of people typing in the chat, um, but I'm, I'm sure the my guess would be the reaction is this doesn't seem fair, or there's, there's something concerning about it, something morally troubling about it. Um, and if we wanted to say, well, you have you have your free choice. You can decide to take that job or leave that job. You don't have to you don't have to take it. Um, and I'm not going to force you. And if you if you decide to take the job and then you're like, this sucks, you can quit whenever you want. I'm not going to get in the way of your will. I'm just giving you an opportunity. You can take that opportunity or you can leave that opportunity. Still seems like the, the way in which we're having a, say, rational debate about what we are going to consensually agree to mutually is not operating on equal footing. That we, we not, we're not... Um, we're not playing with the same deck of cards. Um, someone's got a lot more power in that negotiation if all we care about is consent. And Rawls is like, yeah, this, is, this isn't right. And because all of the agreements that we would make in the actual world are um, sort of uh, always in this morass of power, that's a real problem it's hard to imagine what kind of circumstantial scenario we could create in society, in the actual world, that is going to create um, uh, the ideal terms on which we would all um, be able to have a fair debate about what we should mutually agree on as the rules of justice for our society. This is, the, this is the, like the big barrier, the big concern. Um, people in chat, uh, if you're able to hear me, sorry for, again for the technical difficulties, but do you are you feeling the problem here? Are you feeling the tension? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. Yeah, it's a tough problem. And just saying, well, you live in a democracy, so everyone gets the vote, equal vote. It's like, well, even that is not quite right, because how people are going to try to solicit your vote is also going to be leveraging your circumstances. And there's, there's ways in which different interest groups can have each other over a barrel in the democratic arena, just as much as in the market. Um, so this is this is something Rawls is is grappling with, and like I said, very concerned about bias, very concerned about how our circumstantial positions influence in an undue way our conception of what is universally and objectively just. So his way of dealing with this is not to abandon a kind of um, contractualist model entirely. Um, to not definitely not to abandon a, a social contract ideal, but just like all of the social contract theorists, 
um, Rawls is going to, in a similar way, have his own state of nature situation. He's going to have his own um, ideal scenario under which um, we're going to decide about these principles of society, okay? uh, principles of social justice. It's just for Rawls, this is not something conceivable in the physical world. <laughs> so, like, Hobbes could understand that. You know, he can, even if it's historically inaccurate, we can still imagine, like, starting a commune together or something where we're, where there is no social structure. And same thing for Locke, right? Um, this is a, a much more con a conceivable in our imagination, even if it's somewhat fictional. It, we can imagine these circumstances actually happening. Rawls is like, even those idealized scenarios are going to have the opportunity for these forms of bias to, to creep into them because people naturally do not have equal advantages or um, circumstances. People are in different boats. So for him, for, for Rawls's version of a state of nature, he talks about this thing called the veil of ignorance. And um, Kiana, I know you, you asked about this before we got started here. And that's the main thing I want to talk about next is um, what function the uh, veil of ignorance has in this whole argument and in this whole theory. Um, I, there is one quote, though, I wanted to give you here. Um, the kind of sum, this is a, a quote from Rawls that uh, sums up this um, idea of justice as a result of a, of, a, of a proper process for determining it. He says, justice will be determined as those principles that free and rational persons concerned to further their own interests, special emphasis, would accept in an initial position of equality, the original position, that's his state of nature, as defining the fundamental terms of their association. So that, that kind of, that quote captures everything I've been unpacking for the last 20 minutes. Um, the key thing here is the initial position of equality. This is not something that we imagine as um, the state of nature as Locke conceived of it, where there isn't a adjudicator uh, like the government or a justice system or something like that. Yes, I can repeat the quote. Justice will be determined as those principles that free and rational persons concerned to further their own interests would accept in an initial position of equality, the original position, as defining the fundamental terms of their association. So it's still going to be a matter of what are people going to agree to? We are going to be constructing the principles of social justice. But if we're concerned about that mm -hmm. process having unfair biases interrupting it, we, can't, we have to imagine an initial position of true equality where there is nothing that someone could use or there, there's not a, a, a contrast of circumstances in which someone is in a different position than somebody else or has any possibility of power over them or could be more advantaged in that sort of debate and negotiation than somebody else. Um, we're going to have an open, fair debate about how to set up the rules that we're all going to agree to where no one's able to hold someone else over a barrel or something like that, okay? That situation is never going to fucking happen in the real world. And that is why Rawls goes to a theoretical world. And that is the veil of ignorance. Especially because, notice in that quote, he doesn't eliminate the idea of people making decisions based on self-interest. Rawls is not endorsing self-interest as a moral principle or something like that. Um, and this is kind of one of the interesting parts of his theory that's received a lot of conversation. You know, if you were talking to Mill or you were talking to Kant, they would just say acting on, making decisions based on self-interest is not moral and, and cannot be rationally defended in moral reasoning. Um, so you have to make decisions based on what's in everyone's self in, what what's in everybody's interest, take, like respecting everybody's right to be happy for Mill or for Kant, everyone's dignity as a self-determining end in themselves kind of thing. But Rawls doesn't go that route. He doesn't try to argue for conceptions of social justice that premise that we're all like fully enlightened beings who have no ego and are have been able to kill the self or to destroy self-interest. His strategy is going to be different. 
if self-interest is the way in which our particular circumstances are able to have a biasing effect on what we think is universally or objectively just, instead of trying to get rid of the self-interest, what Rawls is going to try to do with the veil of ignorance is neuter self-interest. Basically, don't give it any resources to work with. You can premise that people are still going to be self-interested, but in some way eliminate the way in which that motive is capable of exerting a distorting effect on the reasoning we're going to use in deciding what kind of conception of social justice we're all going to agree to, that we're all going to consent to. Okay, so this will make a little bit more sense when I talk about this next idea with the veil of ignorance. So I think I described this like in 30 seconds, like weeks ago in the class. Um, oh, first I got a question. Mark says, in the original position, does self-interest and universal interest become the same thing? That is a fantastic question. Um, and I, there's, there's a strong temptation or, or good, really good reason to say the answer to that question is yes. Um, but let me give it to you, and then we'll see what you think of it. Okay, so what happens in the original position under the veil of ignorance? Um, the way I like to describe the situation here, this is not Rawls's words exactly, but it, it captures exactly the spirit of what he's imagining. Imagine that all of our souls, if you believe in souls, it just isn't like our minds or something, our, our ability to reason and think, our mind, that our consciousness, whatever, whatever you want to say metaphysically about it, are sucked out of our bodies and we all go to the moon. So we're all up on the moon and we're thinking we're going to have a big massive discussion with everybody, you know, this is totally impractical and fantastical, but we're going to have a big discussion about how we should set up the principles of social justice. And the, the, the rub here is that when our minds or souls or consciousness is up on the moon, we don't know which body down on earth is ours. That's the veil of ignorance. Um, I don't know what role or class or status in society I have. I don't know what personal property I own. I don't know what my natural abilities are. I don't know what kind of body I have. I don't know what race I am. I don't know what my religious commitments are. I don't know, I don't know anything about what my perspectives um, or intuitions or feelings about what the good is or what is happiness. I don't know what that is. Um, I, all of my psychological propensities or dispositions, I'm not aware of that. I don't know what kind of cognitive, you know, I don't know what kind of brain I've got um, and what sort of inner world of psychology that I'm living in. Um, all of those circumstantial details that make people different from each other are all, I don't know which one is me. So I, and this is the most important thing about Rawls, so many, even commentaries, professional commentar commentators on Rawls oftentimes lose this piece of the theory. But when we're up on the moon, in the original position, under the veil of ignorance, we still know that these differences exist. We're not forgetting about difference. We just don't know which one is us. Okay, so I know that there are, uh, while I'm up on the moon, I am aware that people have, um, cognitive differences. I know that there are all these different religious systems. I know that different people have these different ideas of what happiness looks like. Um, I know that the different cultures that people could be living in. I know the geographical um, and climate-based issues that are different from circumstance to circumstance. I'm aware of people being poor and people being wealthy and all the rest of that stuff. All, I know about all of the things that could be me I just don't know which one is me. Okay, is that making sense? Under the veil of ignorance, my knowledge of who I am is suspended. Yeah, making sense? Okay, so this is why, for Rawls, I can still be self-interested. You know, I'm looking out for myself. I just don't know what to do with that, right? Because I don't know who I am. I'm like, oh, am I, like, I'll just use myself here as an example. Um, oh, I, I'm, I'm a, a philosophy instructor. So I'm all about promoting students taking philosophy classes so I can have a job. Well, under the veil of ignorance, I'm like, there are philosophy professors, but there are also all these other, you know, uh, disciplines as well. I might be, I might be a sociologist. I might be a physicist. I might be a math instructor. I don't know. 
or I might not even be an instructor at all. Maybe I'm, um, I've got the training to be um, a, uh, a welder, or I'm unemployed, or I'm the recipient of millions of dollars of inheritance. You know, I just don't know which of those people I am. And so when I'm going to negotiate for the rules of social justice, because I don't know who I am, I don't know what special interests I should be like aimed for in trying to negotiate for a result that's going to be in my self-interest. That's why I said Rawls isn't eliminating self-interest, he's just neutering it. He's not giving it the information it needs in order to pursue its own self-interest in a way that would be biased. Okay? There is still going to be self-interest here though, um, and that's going to come out in the conversation to follow, but in a way that isn't um, contingent, that has to take into account all the possibilities. So I know we're, we're out, of, out of time here today, but um, Mark, you, you said, going back to your question, you said, does self-interest and universal interest become the same thing? In a sense, yes. Um, I, I think Rawls is giving us a way to imagine what Kant is talking about when he's talking about universalizing maxims without contradiction. Remember for Kant, when we talked about this with his theory, when I'm thinking about a moral rule that I'm going to think is the right one, I have to test whether I would be in contradiction with my own will in agreeing to that rule under all the possible circumstances that I could be in. And this is one way to kind of get into that universal mindset. Am I cool with this rule of social justice if I was at the bottom of society? Would I be cool with it if I was at the top of society? What about everything in between? What about all these other you know, differences of what groups or demographics I might be a part of or what my positionality is? Um, all that kind of stuff. Okay, yeah, I've, I lost track of time here. Time just evaporated on us. Let me give you the code word. Um, code word is... Well, okay, I, I'm just not going to even bother with it. My mug says today, see the good. So that'll be the code phrase for today. See the good. Um, there you go. No, no, Mark. <laughs> See the good. That's what's written on the mug I'm drinking coffee out of right now. I know you can't see it, but uh, those watching on YouTube, you can see that later. See the good. So, um, so that's that's a, the setup here for for Rawls. Um, the kind of process that he wants to use for how we're going to determine the principles of social justice in a fair way. Um, Next time we talk, on Monday, we'll get into um, what are the principles of social justice that Rawls thinks we're going to agree to, uh, and the rationale behind that. So if we're under the veil of ignorance, our, sometimes people have said Rawls's theory is useless, because if you don't know anything about your positionality, you have no basis with which to consider something being better or worse in terms of the principles of justice. Now, Rawls disagrees with that. He thinks there is going to be a basis for making a rational choice, even under the veil of ignorance. Um, but we'll see what, what uh, he says on Monday and what you think of it. Any questions here uh, from chat before I uh, stop, stop the recording for today? I'm deeply sorry again about the technical difficulties. Um, hopefully we won't have this on Monday or ever happen again. Okay. Well, I will bid you adieu. Have a good weekend. Stay tuned for my weekend update. Good luck working on the papers. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see you next time. You too.